G is about to get underway. Avery, we were talking before about uh, some of the stories coming into this matchup. Oh, yeah. And there is a pretty interesting one here for uh, Tundra, right? I mean, if, if you go back 10 years ago, <laughs> right, that's a long time in Dota terms. Snaking used to play on an old team called Team Dignitas mm. way back in the day. And you know that Team Dignitas? It had a UI on it. It mm -hmm. had another good compatriot in Universe on it. Yep. It had our good friend Fogged on it. Of course. And I remember when I picked up Snaking for VGJ, Snaking told me, I feel like since those 10 years ago, no, it was eight then, but you know. Sure. Those 10 years ago, all my friends I used to play with went on to do great things. A UI and Universe went on to win a TI. Yeah, that's all. Giga, Chad, Caster, you know, <laughs> OD, what can you do? And I think back to that story because to me, this is the TI where Snake King is now leading the team. He is captain. He has grown over 10 years. Yep. And, you know, Fog's walking, watching backstage. Howie's watching from literally behind him. What's Universe probably watching happen? from home. It's gonna his living room. What's the worst yeah, I think it's happen? I think it's his year to kind of prove like, hey, very cool of you. I'm gonna live up to the legacy that you guys set and actually <laughs> achieve the dream that I saw all of you go <laughs> that passed me by to a degree. It's a bit of a Bible thump story, you know. I'm not trying to. Tear <laughs> I mean, you're setting here, up because uh, if he does manage to beat OG here, I mean, he's already achieved so much at that point in time that. I agree. OG is one of the scariest teams to be able to match up. You can get that momentum, being able to beat them in the upper bracket. Who knows how far Tundra can go? I mean, that's a great story just because Snaking, from everything that I've heard about him, uh, you know, he's he's gone through some teams and stuff, and oh, yeah. uh, I, I, I've heard that he's, like, can be a little bit hard to work with, but the one thing I've never heard is that he never lacks when it comes to hard work. No. He is there day in, I mean, day out. This match has literally been 10 years in the making for him. Yeah. Like, I mean that literally. This guy has grinded Dota for 10 years. And you're going up against a team that is, in some ways, brand new. Like, this is an OG yeah. debut squad. It's kind of like experience and the veteranship that Snake can bring to his team versus this fresh energy and idea creation and all of that that OG is known for and has destroyed people with for the year. Yeah. To me, that creates an interesting back dynamic to this game that is like, I'm very excited to see how it pans out. And on the other side, we have somebody from OG who definitely not quite the same length of the story when it comes to uh, to snakings. But uh, Misha, I mean, he went through 12 different teams before he finally ended up on that OG roster You know, as a coach. And now he's there as a player and stuff like he took a while. He was like grinding through. If you go through his history, it's like two months here, two months there. You know, like he was just grinding through the Eastern European scene. And he finally has found a home. And look at the success he's gotten. I mean, he was obviously Going through that many teams that quickly, he obviously was not complacent, right? He was obviously just searching for the team that could win him TI. And, uh, well, he's found a place here, and they've already had a great amount of success this season. And it would be a damn shame to head to the lower bracket now. But let's get into it. Pause is done, and we are into it. OG versus Tundra, game one. Look at the early itemization here. 33 going for that Blight Orb. An aggressive build on this Visage. Sometimes we see the early Blade or just early stats for extra last hitting, but it tells me Tundra wants to fight on this lane, trying to abuse the, the squishy support in, if it's Oracle or Maiden up there early and just trade for the kills. We'll see if it pays off. Soxa doing some early war checking. Got the Windlace up already. It's crazy how many small items he has queued up in his quick buy. Like, just, you know, there's a Mango, there's a Clarity, there's a Tango. Like, he's, they're ready for this lane. Uh, I think something something that Tundra does in lanes that very few other teams do is, in their off lane, they won't just, like, we're either pulling waves or not pulling waves. Like, they'll do it randomly in the middle of the lane. Oh, it's two and a half minutes. Let's pull a wave here for this specific reason. Mm -hmm. And people aren't used to reacting to that type of thing because they do it in, like, very specific situations. So suddenly, you do the other team does the wrong thing with the wave, and the wave's by Tundra's tower, and now like, you're like, huh, we can't lane anymore. I think these types of little sneaky things, like, they're they're super aware of. I mean, this Tundra off lane is one of the ultimate lane yeah, they're really scary. disruption teams. <laughs> yeah. You don't know where the waves are. There's a wave by your tier three. There's another one by their tier two. You're like, am I even in the lane anymore? Or is this is the lane in the Roshan pit? It's just so annoying to play against. It, it makes everything you begins. think about what's happening in the lane get thrown off. Yeah, I mean, and you can also, you know, potentially a team like OG, a younger team, is their first team or first time at TI for a lot of them. Suddenly you're out of your comfort zone. There's, you know, you're laning in the river and, you know, things can be a little bit, uh, you know, maybe that, maybe that throws them off more than it would throw off another team. You know, normally, I would agree, Quinn, but if I've learned anything about OG this year, 
their comfort zone is quite literally the entire world. You know, <laughs> nothing happens. In fact, I think the more you throw this team off, yeah, the more they get in zone. Like, you know, if you think you're tilting Amar and he's buybacking early, yep. Now you, he just goes 20 and zero, right? How many times have we seen this? Many, many times. It's, it's a, we talked about that quite a bit, the question of whether or not you should shut down Amar, because it just seems like if you do shut him down, he comes back with a vengeance. We're currently watching the matchup of Nine versus BZM. We see the top lane of Yuragi and uh, Misha in that Morphling lane. We said the lanes are super important here to keep Tundra from being able to snowball. So what are the things we're looking for when it comes to these side lanes in particular? I mean, the lane equilibrium already disrupted top for Tundra. It's a great sign for them. They just want this lane back so the Visage plus Melee hero can go to work, especially if they get level 2 and level 3 fast. This Misha Maiden already got nuked down really hard. And this is kind of a bad sign. You don't want this lane shoved out so fast for Crystal Maiden. She kind of wants to wear you down over the course of that shove out and get the kill at the end. Yeah. And that bottom lane, it's a similar story. OG wants this lane back for the Sand King so he can farm. Tundra wants to keep it up so Snake King can play the lane with the right clicks. Equilibrium super important for these two side lanes early on. You said it, Quinn. It looks like uh, Tundra have already identified we're going to abuse this Crystal Maiden lane. We're going to try and go for those kills. I mean, they're going for it without a nuke on Soxa. They were just throwing the tree at him and hoping to get 33 to I mean, the next out stack. I feel like Misha's going to die here. Oh, yeah. He is very slow, very low. You have the Blight Orb on top of these tree hits. Very scary lane for this Crystal Maiden, and you do not want to feed the first blood to this Visage. It's the one way you're going to power up his early game. Oh, yeah, I mean, you can see the CS bottom lane as well, and the HP levels. Um, it, this lane, they, since they opted to put the bottom five, you don't have as much kill threat in this lane. A bottom uh, Slark is very much chipping you down, abusing right clicks, abusing like individual skill in the CS. And I can definitely see a world where if Tundra plays as well, suddenly Sand King's little HP can't, off, can't come up to the wave. This is Sentry Oh my goodness. Ooh, that was a lot of damage. Skater actually getting super low. That's it. Amar picks up the first blood. Wow, that was, uh, that was a crucial mistake from Skater. Staying up a little bit too long while Sand King's getting the pull off. Feeds that kill away. Now suddenly Amar, 700 gold. He's going to have plenty of HP, plenty of regen. Yeah. Totally changes the, the trajectory of this land. I mean, that's huge for them. This is if, if OG can pick a hero to have a good early lane, it's probably the same. Because normally yeah. this hero gets a few. So if he's getting accelerated, it's even better for them. I mean, that was that lane getting pushed deep, right? You get the Caustics, you get that Burrow. Equilibrium, winning OG, one of these side lanes at least. Quinn, talk to me about this mid matchup, because you're a bit of an expert. I mean, <laughs> you you also have a uh, enemy mid that you play up against quite a bit, and Gunner, who also plays the mid toss all the time. Yeah, we're going to watch uh, Taiga, actually. Looks like he's going to be chased down here, snaking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, the double high ground hit. That was the crimson item. It. That was the oh, crimson. It was Marana. the cosmetic pay to win right there. Damn straight. <laughs> Radiant's bottom tower. But yeah, talk to me about attack. Tusk versus Ember. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that Nine picked Tusk into Ember. I think for a lot of people, they'd be pretty happy playing Ember into the Tusk because you, you just can't kill you ever. And Tusk is a hero that thrives off of early kills, early momentum. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting that Nine picked that. I mean, Nine is a player with a very specific hero pool. Um, but I think both sides will farm early, but it's one of these lanes where the Tusk needs to get stuff done other places because at some point you're going to start getting slighted infinitely and you'll have a way to deal with that regen, right? You can't really punish the Ember back. He's going to sit there and keep pressing this stupid button on you. You lose all your HP. <laughs> and so Tusk is sort of on a timer in that regard. Like, you see the C is very even, but you can already see the slight starting to add up. Once level 5 comes around, level 7, it sort of becomes uninhabitable for Tusk. I mean, you think he's just going to rotate super early this game, or do you just take it and get what you can? I mean, obviously, the Tusk game plan is they probably don't care about this lane too much, right? Whenever you pick mid-Tusk, lanes, yeah. whatever, it's about getting into the mid-game where he's going to one-shot the back line. But do you try and force these early rotations to make up for this lane being a bad matchup? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that depends on how this top lane goes. I think that's where you're really happy to have a player like Neta in the offlane because your offlane is doing pretty well right now. You can look at the CS Morphling very, very low, not doing the greatest in CS chart. Because if Morphling's having a good lane, it's, it's pretty hard for this Tusk to go top. But now Morphling, you know, he's getting a little bit low. Maybe Vizage gets a six fast and maybe s suddenly Tusk, you know, comes up here and tears the game open. I mean, talking about that, you're getting doubled up on Morphling. It's pretty bad. Then. Another Burrow Strike fight. Yeah, Sandstorm doing some work. Snake King's going to hop out of it to be able to finish off Taiga. Should be no problems there. And you can see the strength of the Slark is building up now against the Sand King. He has no options here. He's going to be blocked off. He does manage to pick up the Bounty Rune, yes, but this is uh, all but inevitable. He's going to go for the Burrow Strike, perhaps to the other side of the cliff, but he gets hit by the Snowball first before he could get the jump away. Two kills in the bottom lane for Tundra, making up a bit for that first blood. That's, a, that's better than a Bounty Rune in my book, I'll take it. You also get the permanent Essence Shift agility on Slark because he got the last hit, so... True. Skeeter's going to be happy about that one. 
Yeah, I mean, also some time where the Sork gets to sit in the lane for free. Uh, the faster you get to the six, the scarier it is for Sand King. Because now suddenly the Sandstorm chip damage, like Sork doesn't care. He'll run into it, he'll hit you a bunch, he'll take a bunch of that damage, and he'll reset. And suddenly on Sand King, you'll have a way to regenerate that HP. The lane can start to get a bit dicey. Maybe Tusk comes there and ganks you and kills you, and you have to, you know, it, it can get very hairy very quickly. So maybe the most important thing was the experience that he got out of those kills. I think it was a really big deal. Yeah. That's definitely huge. I mean, it's also about this Piranha doesn't want to sit down here and leech his XP forever, right? She, yeah. At some point, she wants to go roam, play around the Tusk, play around the Visage, who's having a very good early game. Let the Slark get the solo attack. XP, push him up to the level 6 path where he will abuse the Sand King on his own. This game is going to come down to these these rune fights, 6 and 8. 6 one's coming up right now. Socks on top, snaking to the bottom. They want to deny this Ember the rune. They will. Invis for the Tiny. And he's going to sneak away into the night, pick up the Bounty Rune while he's there as well. No. And uh, we'll see the whether or not... Do they have vision of the Invis Rune? Is it possible that he sneaks up on the Morphling here? He might sneak up on his Courier. <laughs> yeah, that's actually what's really going to happen here. Bye-bye, Courier. Mildly annoying. I mean, despite the CS and, you know, maybe the Morphling's HP levels, his net worth is, you know, pretty on par with Visage. The scary thing about this lane, though, is that it only gets worse for Morphling. Once you get to 6, suddenly the dynamic changes, and this just keeps on you. You're morphing down, your armor's going lower, he keeps on, your armor's going lower, and you sort of can sort of get, you know, kicked out of this lane, potentially dive at super high HP. I think mean, 33 side an amazing lane in stages game. Yeah. Like, this is a hero that can't get super abused. That's ideally what you want, but he's already just to level 6, 0 deaths. Higher CS than the Morph. I mean, I don't think Yoragi sat on this lane, but if you're 33, you're super happy. Because again, you are the, the core of these Tundra lineups. You want to get that Wraith Pact and the Auras online. The faster you do, the faster you're enabling everybody else and the type of game Tundra wants to play. Yeah, and you also know as this visage that pretty soon there's a walrus coming your way and there's going to be there's gonna be this tower dive and it's, it's pretty scary for this Morphling. Uh, we'll see how much they try to react to this when it happens. I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see Nine just make that move with the Visage 6. Like, help him kick him out if they feel like they need the help to kick him out. Because, again, like you said, I don't think he wants to just keep sitting mid against these slights. Yeah, but you can see him squirming and dragging. Oh, no. the eggs. They're trying it up, but the burst damage is actually not even close, thanks to, in part, the raindrop that he had. So, Yuragi will go full agility, try and get back some HP where he can. Eight minute rune is coming up. Amar is actually in the neighborhood. Maybe OG is going to put some serious effort here. Nine is going to be chased down by the two supports. BZM, a little bit of catch up and get a slight. Going to go for it. He's going to go for it with the remnants and a little bit more. They got the fairy fire. Here comes yeah. Arrow. Nice shot from Snake King. Beautiful play by him. Snake King, longtime Mirana player. <laughs> going all the way back to bottom bottom. He's been playing this hero for quite some time. It's a little bit new on the five position, but he has some history for sure. I mean, if you're going to play five Mirana, you better hit your damn arrows, son. <laughs> That's all I know. If you miss those, <laughs> your impact goes down incredibly. But definitely bailed out his tusk there. Huge play. Oh, waste some embers time as well. Another arrow. Dyer's two for two. Is under that I've seen. Already a good start. Probably missed five early, but we won't count those. <laughs> oh, they get the pounce. Here comes the rotation there from nine. It shows Dyer's up. And uh, well, we were talking about which of the side lanes are we going to be targeting here at the tusk because we know he's going to rotate around. Choosing to shut down Amar a little bit. Do you think that's a player preference or about the hero? I think it might even be just based on the situation and Netta making the call. If you look at top lane, like it doesn't really look like he needs the gank here. The Morphling's already left the lane. Netta doing some wave dragging shenanigans as expected. The tower is taking damage. These creeps, no one's getting the XP here. You know, maybe he calls, yo, you don't need to come top. Morph already left. I can come up by myself, you know? And sure. Nine makes the smart play, gets the quick kill bottom. Now suddenly you've got pressure in all the lanes instead of just top. Yeah, four to one. Tundra up by a thousand net worth early. Dyer's top I mean, the big power play for me is going to be OG's supports cannot drag their cores into the game, right? These are backline supports with heals and nukes. The upside is once your cores come online, OG's supports come online as well. That's why they're trying to get this blink on uh, on Amar. He's going to do some ancient farming. He's yeah. going to throw it out here. He's going to do some ancient farming right under the nose of Tundra, apparently, while Taiga is going to be chased down by nine here. No hope to be able to save him. Amar popped the healing salve underneath this sandstorm while the rest of Tundra trying to get the last hits. Got a sentry, it seems. Nine's trying to hold the aggro out of the sandstorm yeah. here. Whoa. Got them both. 
Very nicely played. And he gets a little bit of damage. There it is. Now they see him. Oh, the pounce barely off the mark. He throws Shark's over the side. And now BTM is here to be able to help him out of March. Just on the sliver of HP. But it can't quite see him. They're going to be able to kill Skeeter as well. BTM to the rescue. And now nine may be the third pickup as OG. Oh, beautiful shards. BTM doesn't quite have a lot of mana. Does he have enough to be able to jump over to the other side? His slide is not going to be good enough. He has plenty of remnants, but the mana is the real issue. They fed him some mangoes, not good enough. Great fight for OG. I mean, we're talking about enabling the Sand King, getting him to blink. If Sand King dies and you lose that stack, you're absolutely screwed going into this mid game. Now they have a very good fighting chance to get the Sand King online, push towards this Maelstrom on Ember, who again, who's having the best game in this game right now? It's BZM. Yeah, he yeah. is very farmed. I mean, uh, you can uh oh, nice shot. Burst down Amar with the help of the birds. They'll keep that chain stun going. Snaking, even though he missed that arrow earlier. And uh, recovery one gets another kill on Amar. Continuing to shut him down bottom of all the cores right now. Yeah, I mean, such clutch play from Snaking, honestly. Uh, going there and not letting the Snaking, you know, sit in the trees and sit there and defend Radiant's forever because you don't have detection. Snaking immediately up there has two sentries, puts Sneaky one in the trees, Amar doesn't expect it, goes down. Like, that's really painful. You're 800 away from this blink. You already farmed your Ancient stack. Like, where are you going to get this gold from? There's more pressure from Tundra coming. Dying your mid tower is under attack soon. Under your heroes attack. are under attack. Your triangle. Um, and the Sanking can't really contribute. You have to weather the storm here. You have to do it through this Ember, too. Like, OG needs to fight through this Ember Spear right now. Ideally, keep this mid tower alive as long as they can. There's going to be some move to collapse on it, likely coming out from Tundra here in the next five minutes or so. And shutting down the Sand King holding that top tower does also speed up your mid rotation. You don't want to let him sit up there yeah. and just delay the game. You want to have this Visage be able to progress through the objectives he wants to do. Maybe a little triangle farm on the menu as well. And I mean, he is really far. This is going to be a fast raid pack. And that's probably why, once he gets that raid pack, then we're trying to take down that mid tower, right? I think there's some move that can come out, either to the jungles, you can go triangle. You want to use it to, to get the five man going. I know oh, go <laughs> that was so greedy. He really tried to hold it for nine, but ultimately Soxa did have to pick it up. Pretty clutch from Soxa to click it there at the end and not like hope nine got it. Like that was, that was pretty, that was pretty clutch. I mean, I think uh, what I would have left it for you, though. I appreciate that. Mm. You know, otherwise, you were going to yell at me after the game. I <laughs> let's, not, let's keep that off, off broadcast. <laughs> Thank you. Power runes, man. <laughs> I mean, I think what Ned is doing here is something that is pretty cute and like uh, something Faith Beyond's done in the past, but occasionally on these offlaners that can farm Ancients, if you don't feel like you have the ability to go mid for whatever reason, maybe OG has too many heroes there, you rescind a little bit, you farm the Ancients, you get your pot on this level 7, now suddenly, you know, I have this little bit stronger time maybe a minute later, and uh, I think that's something that Tundra is more willing to do than a lot of other teams, who so maybe lose a little bit of focus, maybe they force this mid push a bit too much, waste some time, and now suddenly their economy gets hurt a lot, and OG, you know, starts to creep back a little bit. I mean, this Radiant is the Slark Diffusal. We're on a level 7. Amar's just channeling. Yeah, he you know. Ooh, okay, okay. Snowball, they're gonna go for Misha here. Amar still trying to set up. Good save from Taiga. The Crystal Mane's still eventually gonna die. And look at that. Soxa gets a really nice toss back onto the Oracle as well. Taiga does what he can, but ultimately, he's just gonna be throwing damage around before he eventually dies and gives another stack over to Skeeter. And the amount of pump fakes from Amar. I thought he knew that smoke was coming. I was like, yeah, oh my, seriously. how does he know? But. I think they were just, again, anticipating this mid-move. They had the Sand King blink. They Dyer's had the Ember Maelstrom. Has fallen. Maybe Tundra's a little too fast, caught him off guard, and that mid-tower going down is really going to open up the map here. It's going to open up the Roche down the line more as well. They, and, they, and they didn't get the fight. I think that's the fight that OG wanted more than anything, right? Like, you want to be able to take that fight with the blink, with the Maelstrom around that tier one that can protect your supports. Instead, you just get collapsed on. Now, where's your next opportunity to fight? Now you got to kind of play the map. Make an aggressive move of your own. This, this is a nice move. It connects. Socks in. Socks in. Just throws the tiny. Does what he can, but uh, he is going to be the victim of this smoke. But what is OG going to do yep. with that? Uh, yeah. Support pick off doesn't necessarily mean you can put pressure on the mid tower or anything. Oh, they wanted Slark or, or Tusk out of that move. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very cute. That is a very Tusk thing. First the punch, then the high five. I can't kill you, but I'm going to sit here and annoy you. I'm going to cast my spells. You're going to be mildly irritated. <laughs> But there's more coming now, and yeah, I mean, the map being small like this, OG's heroes, they can only really kill you out of small. Oh, they surprised him, but the Shrink Morph went off just in time, and now that is actually baited 9 into death here because OG actually brought the full party here. Everybody but Amar is hanging out in this Radiant Jungle.
Yeah, a bit rushed from Tundra. Uh, to be honest, I'm surprised they're not pushing things a little bit more. The Slark having the Diffusal Blade. Bottom tower is under attack. Ooh, good sentry laid out. Spotted Skeeter. He knows. He actually thought maybe there was a ward or something. Be able to deal with the sentry in time. Master tier Slark carrying his own sentries. That's how you know someone's a Slark player. I mean, nowadays, Slarks are incentivized to do it. Find those wards, they're worth so much. Was it his sentry though, or did someone else buy it for him? Because you know, well, there's a difference. No, there surely he difference. bought it because he wants yeah. the bounty for it. He bought it. Oh no, he planted it. I can't see. GG. Looking for a bar again. Oh, sneak it in from behind. Sox is going to be able to get the toss back, and they land the pounce immediately afterwards. Burrow strike in a second, but he can't get it off in time. That pounce just lasted too long, and the TP had to be canceled. So this is a free tower push. Yeah, a pretty cool adaptation for Pundro. They're not the Dyer's sneaking staying up there in the top lane, sort of keeping it pushed in after Nine died up there. And they say, okay, that's fine. So now you can stay there. We're going to go across the map with the rest of the heroes. We're not afraid. You know, our cores don't need to farm. We're going to connect them. We're going to fight with them. We don't need our, you know, supports to be in every move. So Snae's just sort of chilling up there, and the cores go down and take this tower. They pressure the Sand King. And then suddenly, maybe your main woods are under threat, or you have to waste a glyph on this tier two bottom, and then you have the next tier two. Yeah, so there's the glyph. That's a unique aspect of Mirana as a support, right? It kind of functions like those hood wings or something, because he could be up there and probably won't die because of his mobility. Well, Soxa, well, he doesn't have the same kind of options and once again will be victim of OG's aggression. They're immediately going to smoke up afterwards here, but it was underneath the high ground ward. Yeah, he's going to break it. Nine. Good job there. Breaking a bit of the smoke. OG. I know they've been spotted, but yeah, they're still going to go for that mid tower regardless. It's low. Is a clip here. Uh, free pick up on Nisha, yep. but there is going to be the jump in from DCM. He's getting caught by the birds, perhaps. They, the Morphling cut out of mana. Needed to go for Snake King, gets burned out of all this mana. They land the pounce there as well. And 33 is full hill. Here comes the epicenter and Nisha with a great ultimate as well. The arrow! It stops the epicenter. No chance for Amar. A toss back from Soxa. What a hit with the avalanche shots combination, bringing everybody low. And Tundra just got to clean through the OG heroes. Oh man, what an arrow to stop that epicenter. So much damage to gain in the fight. OG cannot clean it up. I'm not sure they were going to be close with that Ray Pack down and put already on this Visage, but absolute disaster. BZM off just getting his mana burned on the jump, yeah. too. He just remnants straight into birds, and Skeeter sitting there like, oh, you did the pounce for me, son. Just drains all his mana, gets the stacks up. Tundra cannot ask for a better fight. And I was about to say, this game has felt very reactionary from OG in terms of being very patient, waiting for the fights, the right ones they want to take. The aggressive smoke moves are, I think, are just hard for them this game. Yeah, but you can see very good positioning from Tundra in this fight. They, this, you, it's rare you see a full duration CM ult and they lose the fight. Like, yeah. They just left them alone. He pressed the CM ult and they just said, ah, fine, do it. And they walked away and they fought on the other uh, outer ridge. And you see, the, you know, CM, she doesn't really do that much in this fight. And she, there's not much she can do. Tundra, really, really nice positioning. It's fine. In crazy toss back. Yeah, that was beautiful landing that combination on three different heroes. Fight was. That was like the last nail in the coffin right there. OG, oh, I mean, this just. You're talking about how they, they really set the tempo of this game, but it just feels like they are very uncomfortable. This does. I wouldn't imagine, like, if you took away the logos and everything, I just wouldn't think this is OG. Radiant's bottom tower yeah, I mean, that's... Is sorry, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think that, that smoke just felt very pressured. Like, you see the way Ember Remnant's in there. Like, it's very, like, we're losing. We need to make something happen. I need to catch yeah. a guy. Oh. Pounce immediately afterwards. Manta trying to dodge a little bit of damage. She does manage to get the flight jump away just in time. The pounce faded, but Nine is just able to go for the next hero. Taiga, he was there to try and help out BZM and may have been able to do something, but uh, does cost him his own life. And apparently cost them their tier two top tower as well. Things are getting very dark indeed for OG in this game one. The lead's gonna build here. The one thing about OG is this team is very good at stalling games. Like they understand that they are a very strong late game team between the three cores synergizing in the late game fights with the net worth they can bring out. I've seen them take fights from 20k down like it was nothing. The thing they have to keep in mind is you're playing against a Slark Marana lineup. So one, you have this Moonlight that can move people around very fast, set up a lot easier. You cannot sentry everywhere on the map, especially these deep side lanes you want to split push. And then Slark is going to run around and kill all your vision. It just makes it even harder on top of that as well. So while I think OG has the heroes to split push this game out and take a later game fight with the Ember timings, I think there's also a lot of tools on Tundra's side to shut that down and just destroy the vision, and we're already seeing it. Like, you just got up some deep, dire wards, but Skeeter's running through here, and he's pinging it. And he's literally just pinging, hey, guys, check around the area. Get some freebies. 
Yeah, I mean, they get these may get these wards, but I think OG not that unhappy with the way the map is being split right now. You see them run all the way down bottom, touch a reaction. OG's already up in top lane, buying some time. Like, you know, the gold lead, since they got the Aegis, not really changed very much. Feature, that was rather bold. Anything for that extra frostbite, I guess. Uh, you just walked in melee range of the birds on that one, and I'm just like, okay, we are already planning on pressuring some more. Ooh, Amar? Saksa really trying to force this by going behind. It does set up Amar for the opportunity. The epicenter oh. for the avalanche actually went out there, installed things out, and with the Morph playing already dead, there goes all your Yo. damage. Tundra, they're just way too big. I mean, how, where's your damage going to come from? You yeah. already have full Wraith Pack type on this visit. Sanking does literally no damage yeah, at that you, you point. You do nothing. I think if Sanking channels all of his spells and connects them on everybody, you're doing like 500 damage. And they sit there and go, what's up? You know? On top of that, you still have Aegis on the Slark. I just, I don't think you can take these fights. I don't even think OG should really be trying to take these fights. I don't think it's possible. Even if 99% of your theory goes right. I think this you have to still push this map. Maybe if you do that, your win probability isn't as high as taking that tier two fight. I can understand why they feel like maybe there's an opening, but this is just a rough spot to be in. And now Skeeter with the Murata ult, nice little synergy, finding the freebies. Quick kill on Misha, no problem. Yeah, I mean, this comes back to, I mean, we talked about the heroes and the fact that OG's hero, OG's damage, very, very similar. And suddenly this Wraith Pack Pike comes out, you're looking at the heroes and you're like, wow, we can't kill anyone. And when you're in that state where you're just dodging and you're just sliding around on the map, it's all on the other team to mess up because they have all the power in the world. They can kill you and you can't kill them. And suddenly they're just squeezing you in. You're getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And then suddenly you have no net worth and they just throw on you. I agree. This map is entirely Tundra's control, and like we saw earlier, they're just farming it up Tundra's everywhere. I mean, Skeeter's just Hard. going into the whole team alone. Finds an opening here, Taiga. Not going to be hit by the arrow, but still hit by that extra pounce. He's going to have a little bit of help here. He does, of course, have the Aegis, so it's perfectly fine for Skeeter to be super aggressive here. After all, he's setting up the rest of the team to come in from behind. Nice block in there with the shards. It's going to set up an arrow. That's going to land onto Taiga. They're going to lead their supports behind OG. Full bailing out once again. They do not have the firepower to win team fights. They cannot win five on five. So as soon as Tundra shows up in force, they have to retreat. I mean, this is high ground. This is this glib for sure. I think Tundra just stays around. Are you afraid of any sort of five on five at this point? No, you have all the auras. You have the drum on Snake King. He has four staff as well. All the visage auras that we talked about. You have BKB on your tusk. This is such a huge power spike at 20 minutes of the game. What can OG do? They're, they're literally just helpless. They're watching their buildings die. I think if Tundra went top, which, I mean, they're probably going to play it safe and farm a little more gold, wait for the right jump. But, I mean, there's the drum, the four staff, the wraith pack, the pipe. Like, they've got all the Tundra items, all and there. They're, they're running it down your throat. Nice. Good toss back. I mean, he just has so many setups, right? If he tossed some shade up in the air, it would have been an arrow. He tossed them over the Skeeter to allow the pounce to land. Tips start coming out, sneaking. I mean, Amar, no impact, no idea. He has not had a whole lot of fun in this Sand King game. And I think so much of the story of this game comes back to the draft and where we were talking about how they were preemptively setting up for Tundra's like zoo stuff and how they drafted a certain way specifically. And it seems to have put OG out of their own comfort zone. I mean, Amar does not look like Amar right now. It's Sand King. Uh, He's a very hit or miss hero. Like when he hits and he starts snowballing, he is super, super strong. But when you when miss, he misses, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's real. It's hard. struggle. I mean, he's buying Bale. How many times have we seen Holy a bar buying crap. Bale Ooh. in his career, you know? This is not the item I think he would ideally like to be buying this deep into the game. But they are just searching for any sort of extra damage at this point. Yeah, you can see your bull. Uh-oh. Oh, up with the punch, the snowball, the arrow coming in as well. The strength warp is doing its work, but now they've got the pounce, and that's going to be good enough. Misha, freezing field, but he get, just dies too damn quickly. BCM is going to be locked down. Amar goes through, hits the pro strike, only onto one. They're focusing on 33, but he is super tanky, and Skeeter is completely uncontested. One by one, he will just knock down these heroes, take away their agility, and that is it. OG. Oh, GG out. This is no contest. Tundra, 26 and 7 in this game one. This had to have been a hell of a confidence boost here on the main stage of TI. I feel like Tundra got to run their playbook exactly how they want to. And I think one of the big things about that draft in, in that game is OG knew that the zoo was coming, right? They left yep. it in the bands. You know they can always pick this Vicious at any point and flex all the other heroes to wherever they want to flex them, you know, usual. So you know this Wraith Pack pipe is coming. You know this is Tundra's game, but.
pieces uh, they charge into each other. Into each other. <laughs> We're gonna find out what happens when when that indeed plays itself out. We're heading over to Cap, SPG, and Quinn for the answer to that. Thank you, Sheever. That's right. We're heading into game two here. Our panel has already stated, hey, this is looking like a much better setup. Quinn, in fact, backstage is saying, yeah, this game actually looks playable. <laughs> what changed in the draft that we feel so confident that OG is going to have a better time game two? I think the lanes are much easier for OG to function. Um, I also think whenever you look at the way the damage is dealt this game compared to the prior game, uh, if anything, I would say Tundra is more in terms of this similar low damage types of thing. You have Shaker, you have Spear Breaker, you have Potom, who without a really good start is not super high damage. Life Stealer, it's a lot of these sort of very mid-range damage heroes sort of go from the front. You're against a Timbersaw, you're against an Oracle, a Primal who's tankier than uh, the Ember last game, PL who has very, very good scaling this game. I think there's a lot of dynamics that are nicer for OG this game. Yeah, I, I think the two off or the two heroes that OG want going in the series, in a back. sense, are Pango, which is getting first phase banned. I don't think yes. they're ever gonna get it. And to me, the Timber. I think Timber is outside of the tide, the one hero Amar plays that can have a really good early game and then be that bulwark in the mid game versus what we saw last game, which is Tundra going high ground at 20 minutes, right? Timbersaw yeah. thrives in that environment as long as he gets a good start and I mean, we're looking at the best Timbersaw player in the world right now. Uh, I've watched this guy all season long destroy people on Timbersaw, and I expect nothing else. Like, this is the time to show up. I, we, were, we were joking about it, but if you looked at those last ban phase, go back three months, they banned Razor and Viper last two, and he got Timber. <laughs> These were the three that were first phase banned, and he always got mm -hmm. one. So very much in Amar's comfort zone. Obviously, the, the hero's a bit different now, but my expectations are just as high. Yeah, I mean, he's someone who understands the hero at such a level. His item build from game to game, you'll see it shift like crazy. One game, you know, he'll go the classic, the Hood, Kai Assange. The game against us, he had like a four staff, a Yules, a Halberd. Yeah. Some crazy <laughs> builds. He bought it like no Kaya. Dude understands the hero at a really deep level. I, I remember watching that game and thinking like, I've never seen so much utility out of a mark before in my life. Yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. It was super right for the game. Definitely going to be a very different change of pace. I'm also curious about this mid matchup. The, the panel discussed a little bit the Spear Breaker versus the Primal Pace. This matchup is very weird, right? Because you're. Oh, right. Well, as I say that, and already off to a different pace, that Timber Saw lane getting damage done between the heavy nuke damage. Snaking pays the price with level one Star Storm. Yeah, it seems Snaking uh, just really underestimated the firepower of this lane. That's very awkward. But yeah, back to this. I mean, we, we don't ever see this matchup. What is this? I don't think anybody's ever seen this matchup. Maybe Quinn, only have you nine. ever played this I've one? I've never played or seen this. It okay. looks like it might be Spear Breaker favored. Yeah, uh, Quinn, walk us through the details of this matchup. Yeah, really get into the minutia. So, we, Unga we need your Bunga. <laughs> um, that's that, that's, that's the most of it, yeah. <laughs> He's walking them down. Oh, there it is. You okay. said it. I know. It's just who, who bigger, you know, who bigger who? He is that's all it yell is. And, 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 <laughs> and Primal, yeah, Primal Beast has got the uproar. He's the biggest yeller. I'm not sure what happened. Maybe Nine charged him aggressively to try and stop him from CSing, and then he got he yelled on. That might He might have, like, pushed it a bit too much, because I think what should happen is both of the 70 damage Unga Bunga heroes should just, like, CS realistically for most of the lane, but I think he might have got a little too aggressive, and yeah. it's a pretty, pretty costly death. You get behind on levels, and suddenly maybe this starts happening more. Yeah, he's being pressured again by uh, BCM. I mean, it seems like you have to save this charge for the trample disconnect, yeah. you know? And if that's on cooldown, it, this matchup looks Radio not that much fun. Scan. On top of that, this bulldoze working with how the Primal Beast ults worked isn't that great, because you yeah. can't status resist it. It's oh, kind of a, okay. it's a weird matchup, right? Uh, I'm not sure if the planar pocket thing is yeah, in there too. The planar, po the planar <laughs> pocket completely negates his ult. It just ends, yeah, right? It just yeah. negates. So this is a very weird matchup on how the spells interact. I don't know. We might see some crazy stuff. But I'm a mid spear breaker. I mean, you can't, can't not love it, right? Uh oh, charge on charge. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this one, that's for certain. Bottom lane, 33 under pressure here. You're gonna have to throw out the Fisher. They throw some damage back at Groggy. Groggy's Holy okay. Crap. Man, he was really thinking. He doesn't even have Phantom Rush. There was no way he was gonna do anything there. I mean, he might regret that Lance. Now, pretty much zero mana. So if he ever gets a uh, solo assumption, he's not going to have a way to dodge it with no uh, doppelganger. And no more kill potential with no more Lances either. So he's going to be in CS and chill mode for the rest of this lane now with no mana, realistically. That said, I feel like OG's a bit happier with CS and chill with the PL versus yes. the decision as opposed to the morph. Because the PL can actually hit the early Diffusal, Manta, Heart, whatever order you want to go to get those items, and suddenly Visage teamfight becomes a lot more annoying, right? You have a great Wraith Pack killer, you have a great hero that can go and tank up a lot of the early 
attention spells and suddenly turn the tide. But I feel like OG is a lot happier with this laning phase in the last game. Yeah, but I think you've also got a lot better ways to rebuff this Visage if he goes to your tower. You've got a Timber who can TP him. Good luck killing yeah. him this game. You've got a Primal who can gank the Visage. Once Peel gets this diff you, Visage just can't just kick him out on his own. Like, Peel's gonna come in and say, yeah, come fight me. I'll burn all your mana. I'll kill you, you know? So, I think Visage this game compared to last game, it is not even close to the same, like, level of terror. Mm -hmm. I agree. You're gonna arrow Timber Saw under his tower and dive him? Mm -hmm. It might be a different one. story. So it looks like OG CS Wise pretty happy with all their lanes. The Phantom Lancer, who's bottom of the bunch, really isn't that far behind. Seems like mid lane's going very well, which is a little surprising to me. Taiga is going to be able to pick up the kill on Seeking again here, as uh, he just does not seem to match up well against this four Oracle. Misha getting a little bit low, but so is 33. Yuragi gunning for it. Does have one more Phantom Rush, and that final swing will get the kill. A big one to be able to take down 33's Visage. Already setting him behind in laning phase. Three OG cores pushing the top here of CSN net worth. Very different start from last game. I think this is what they wanted to have happen last game, where that early magic damage draft can come in. This time, I think their draft's a lot more well-rounded, and they're having a way better early game. Should bode bo very well for them. Does that was not how I charge beat spear bigger <laughs> charge. <laughs> that was not how I thought that interaction was gonna go. And it makes me question, like, besides the planar pocket, like if the charge isn't gonna be working, then what? Maybe it's something about the angle there, because I feel like you just have to yell louder. Oh, right? okay. Everybody knows the mics, they have volume, volume detection. So mm. if you yell louder while you're charging the it's game. It's like a DS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. It's the fourth <laughs> barrier. It gives you the charge advantage. I mean, we have so many innovations in Dota. What's one more for this line of it, you know? Some shenanigans going on. I mean, Level six already on BZM. This setup is pretty rough. Like, if he ever presses trample, nine is just going to lose, like, you know, a third of his HP, maybe half. Uh-oh. Not looking so good here. Nice dodge there. Not getting hit by the aftershock. The Fisher may allow Sox then to get back to the tower in time. Yeah, we saw the charge icon down there too. That was not Nine setting up a gank. That was Nine surviving the gank on mid. And now having to walk back to base. BZM with the earlier level six just pulverizes him back to the fountain. Taiga with some rotations. Again, four Oracle. OG's playbook for the event. They believe in what this hero can provide in terms of sustain for their Tricor. And if the Tricor comes online, it's going to be a lot more powerful. Hello. Goodbye. It is still the haste rune, though. Oh, nice. That was a good pickup. His <laughs> Primal Beast with the haste rune is, I mean, that hero already, I love this Primal Beast mid. I mean, it just feels like it has so much impact. We start off with the Lance Chance Qualifier. We watch Thompson play it, even if they didn't manage to uh, make it through that event. Uh, they still showed the strength of this mid primal beast. He just is everywhere around the map constantly. Yeah, this hero is is very, very strong. The kill that he provides is crazy. He gives you initiation. He can scale like crazy. He gives you a little buttload of stuns as the game progresses. And yeah, lanes are just non scott fighting. Yeah, Misha is going to get a bit low here. Enough to push him back. Here comes the uh, actual charge. First big rotation. The actual charge coming in from nine. They're going to start throwing some damage into Yuragi. They manage to force him to use the doppelganger early, which means this charge is going to be beautifully oh. placed. Misha interrupt, but they can't quite stop it. Nine still gets off his ultimate and will be able to get the kill on the yeah. Museum is now here. The and dinosaur. he just grabs up Soxa, slams his head into the pavement, and bye bye supports. There's nowhere for him to run to. Taiga will gladly take that killing spray. He's like, you know what, guys? Yeah, I'm going to play the sacrificial role. I'm going to play these healers and stuff, but I still want the last hit. This right here is not what you want to see. Yeah. Life Stealer has been kicked out of his lane, and that is a worry. Um, if you're ever on the team with Life Stealer and he's getting forced to leave. BCM protecting Taiga and the setup here. Taiga. Secures the kill with the purifying flames, a dominating streak for him. Yeah, I mean, sort of uh, the flip script from last game. You start to worry about Tundra's damage a little bit. Suddenly, this Shaker, Spearbreaker, Nakes together. Level 3 Potom, you're looking at, you know, a Timber Saw and a Primal with an Oracle behind them. You're wondering, I wonder if they're going to be able to kill these heroes as time progresses. I, I don't see Amar ever dying in this game. <laughs> what is actually going to kill this guy? The Visage can't do much to him. The other heroes you said not doing much. Are they going to get a fast vessel in this game? I don't even think they're going to get fast urn. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this guy's going to be invincible. And oh, he's begging for a badge. Okay, they do manage to get it, it off of the Fisher. 
Skeeter is joining in here. I mean, they got to do something a little bit funky here because, as you said, this game is not setting up well. So apparently all charge. the cores are going to come into this mid area and try and chase down BZM. With the uproar, he's got some armor, so he's not the easiest to kill, but he will eventually go down. Just five men off that onslaught, no escape mechanism. That's a huge pickup for them. That is the one core they can try and abuse, because I don't, the Phantom Lancer, maybe you kill him once more or whatever, but he is going to escape to the jungle. You're not gonna find him for a while. This Timber Saw is invincible. You gotta try and abuse something on the map here with your Tundra, and it's probably this BZM, you know, abuse him with your charge, charge him back. OG's gonna have free reign playing behind the bar right now. He's once again trying to solo kill Snaking. They have the burst, spells, half a second off. I mean, you can see Mara drawing circles there a second ago. Like, he's clearly a bit frustrated this Potom's able to sit up here and stall. Like, the tower probably could have died maybe a minute, minute and a half earlier, but the Potom's up there being annoying, dragging some waves. And the, the move Tundra made bottom earlier where the Oracle TP, the Marcy TP's back down there, Primal TP, suddenly this, this Potom gets some time up top. Nakes is just farming mid the whole time. You can see he got kicked out of the lane, but his net worth is not bad. It's considerably above the PL, so... The move from uh, Tundra bottom earlier having pretty big dividends for slowing down this timber a little bit inadvertently. And with the damage problems we uh, outlined for Tundra, it feels like Marana actually having levels could be really important. Yeah, that, those levels in Starstorm make a lot of difference. I mean, the levels for both supports. Like, the extra Fissure levels. This Fissure is a pretty high damage nuke now, but you need the levels potentially shard to, to really maximize it. Yeah, particularly with the 10 talent, we've talked about that. You know, how good it is with the shard and everything. It's no. a surprising amount of damage. This is like last game, Amar moving down bottom to defend the tower against the 33 Visage push. Only now, he can actually do it, right? Yeah. He is a much bigger boy with a lot more armor than that Sand King. <laughs> Snaking, he went and denied the rune. The Fisher comes out, and BZM still managed to get the charge forward. Snaking is going to be grabbed up here. Slam, slam, slam. He doesn't have a leap, so bye-bye, Snaking. 9-4, to four, OG, not up by a huge amount of net worth, but it does feel like... They're kicking things into gear, and it's about to start snowballing against Tundra. Oh, yeah. They got all the levels in the world on BZM here. And l last game, it was hard to get this Oracle in the game because their cores were behind. This yeah. game, BZM, as we're seeing, they can use the Oracle early nuke damage to help them get these kills. OG has all the damage in the world on these early games. They are also going to have double purge, right? You have Fortune's End. You have Timbersaw rushing Yules. Mm. It's another interaction that makes the game hard for Nine. He's not just going to have free bulldoze going in charging getting yeah. the connection and con dealing the damage you get yules once you get purged once I'll keep it for top of um, check in with the teams there for a second just seeing what they're up to and it feels like OG will feel pretty good about them. they do have tundra they are gonna have to start making some moves and uh skeeter once again is gonna try and get involved here He's going to go infest inside of Nine. They're going to try and set this up. Nine actually popping out of that smoke. Taiga's already here as well. They're going to start scouting things behind the tower. They're going to go for Amar, but Taiga is behind him. They need to be able to address this Oracle and kill him quickly. They get that fast kill, and now Amar will see if they can chase him down. Soxa was on the other side of things. He's going to need Team's to hit coming. a lot of stuns, and the rest of OG, yeah, they're here. Amar turning around with the Chakra, the Moonlight Shadow, allows them to get on top of BZM. Uh oh, All they right. didn't have any detection. They didn't expect this one. Even with the arrow coming, it's not needed. They just bursted down that Primal Beast. Where was all that damage? The light, is the Life Stealer just pumping out a lot of damage on that Primal Beast? Yeah, apparently so. I mean, I think this uh, this Timber TP bottom maybe looks a lot better than it actually was. I think if you compare it to, like, the, the games where this TP feels extremely powerful, there's not that much pressure on the next top. You see him just pour top, and he just runs all the way down the lane. And the way this Timber is bottom, like, it's not like Tundra's forced to go there. They're not getting squeezed elsewhere, you know? So he's sitting there, and he's not really pressuring much. He's delaying the tower, so I'm sure. But at any point, Tundra has the map sorts themselves. They can make this move there, and it's a bit awkward for OG. Yeah, they're trying to run it back and get the punish without the numbers. Double core and commitment for OG. Sox are trying to intercept. It was a good echo, but unfortunately, he just doesn't have the damage. He doesn't have the levels, no aftershock, or just level one, rather. So he's probably going to get chased down as well, and Snaking just has to fully abandon this bottom lane. OG showing up in force. I think that was the type of skirmish they were looking for, right? It has to connect between Amar and BZM, being those frontliners, getting in there, setting up the fight. Like you said, Skeeter does get to push this top lane all the way to the tier one. He will enjoy this time, and he's catapulting up the net worth. Yuragi not far behind, though. He got tier one mid on his own during all that fighting. Pretty big objective for OG they got for free, and 
I mean, he's cruising as well. This is a pretty damn good Phantom Lancer game. Yeah, very scary. I think, if anything, in the past couple of minutes, Yoragi probably the biggest winner having this bit of downtime. He can just ignore everything, pretend there are no other heroes in the game. He's playing World of Warcraft, mm. and he is just <laughs> collecting the gold like it's his job. And it kind of is. A little bit of PvE action for him. The carry player's dream. Yes. Okay, so we talked about they, they don't have that many answers to Phantom Lancer. How good is Spirit Breaker in that regard? When he gets to like his Aghanim Scepter and his like the AoE charges that he does, can he be okay? I think Spirit Breaker's fine. Like Spirit Breaker and Shaker, they both give you tools to help control the Lancer a little bit. In the very late game, I think the Spirit Breaker matchup gets better because his damage gets amped a lot, right? If we're talking like Sage and Kaya territory with Ags and you're just getting huge charge throughs. You can also take the fight on the back line with the Breaker and kind of ignore the PL a little bit. Sure. With the Visage Birds coming in to help can be a route they go. In terms of direct counters though, Maybe you're going to try and build some Maelstroms. Skeeter's already queuing one up. Uh, I mean, but you're going to need a lot it. of small counters put together, yeah. right? Because Life Stealer, yeah. he really doesn't address Phantom Lancer at all. Not yeah, I mean, you have the stuns on Tundra, but you don't really have the damage. So maybe there's some point where PL doesn't have the tankiness yet. Maybe he's got a Yasha and he's working on a Manta, you know, but he doesn't have the heart yet. And maybe there's some good fight where they can abuse the stuns. But there comes a point where the heart starts coming around. It, maybe it gets a little bit spooky for Tundra. There's a window there where they really lack the damage to deal with this PL. Comes the charge. Don't even need to use the ultimate for VCM. Once again, Sneaky's just going to the lanes that I think nobody else really wants to go to. And occasionally he'll tank a death or two, but he's just trying to get something out of this. 33. They want this. Oh, we're gonna knock to low ground. Got knocked to the low ground, and Misha pursues after him. Oh, that wasn't oh, what you dude. wanted whatsoever. Did Misha, I wonder if Misha had the idea that, like, don't worry, guys, I'll toss him back up on the yeah, high I think ground. Because so. <laughs> that is not the place he wanted to be, for certain. I mean, there's a lot of hero displacement spells in this game. <laughs> yeah, there is. Like an acrobat session or something. People are going to be bounced around. I think... Yeah, we see Yuragi. He, he's actually going S and Y here. So he's going to build S and Y into heart. That is going to be extremely hard for Tundra to deal with. Meanwhile, BZM, he's just keeping his pedal, his foot on the pedal here. Yep, trying to go for Zoxa. They do have Skeeter showing up with the charge coming through as well. BZM may be in a bit of trouble here, but Taiga's sitting in the back. He's ready to go with the save of the False Promise. Misha, he's going to use it there. Taiga, Misha turns just around. Fight. He does what damage he can. False Promise is going to wear out. He probably will die here, but at least he did some damage on his way out. Taiga almost getting charged. They lose Vision. Oh, now the they get into the charge. Oh, the self purge. What a beauty. And a big onslaught in from BZM. Knocking back. Down Snake King first with the Infest inside of his nine. They're going to be able to get a little bit of a reset here. But is OG going to keep pursuing? Is Your Tundra going to fight here. back underneath his tower? Both teams posturing, fainting, but ultimately not pulling the trigger. What a sick fortune's end by Taiga there. Catches them both, prevents the charge connection, gets Very the purge nice. as well. And BZM is just really oh, the damage is just overwhelming. A DD for BZM he sees the charge in from nine and knows, hey, that's a freebie. That's all me right there. Yeah, I mean, here's where the map starts to get a little bit spooky for Dyer. Suddenly things are really open. This PL has a lot of free reign, and Tundra still hasn't taken this bottom tier on all the towers still up. You start looking at places where you can realistically get kills, and those places are few and far between. The you know biggest one being this bottom area, and OG is taking advantage and winning those fights. So where is Tundra going to open things up? Yeah, there's only one place Tundra can fight, and it's always Amar sitting here preventing them from doing that. Nine's gonna TP down, but he's just stuck here too. He's trying to get the Shadow Blade, but an item that can help them open up some of these areas, make it scarier for the PL to push deep. It has to connect with something though. I don't think the Spear Breaker has enough damage on his own. It has to connect with the Marana or the Earthshaker on top. Soxa is choosing to go Shard over the Blink, so he will play off those Fissures, got the levels of it, needs some extra Aftershock. It's yeah, it makes sense. It, it feels like they do need the impact right now, right? It's, yes. I mean, we start stalling out the game any longer, we get to the point you were talking about, right? Where the Phantom Lancer is too tanky for them to deal with. Yeah, it is It is very spooky. I mean, Avery talks about this uh, Spirit Breaker being able to pick people off a little more, but... Grabbed. Skeeter does still have the Rage. No Infest, though, so he's going to have to back out. BZM realizing that he's actually still has some capabilities of fighting here, especially with the rest of OG backing him up. Tundra was smoking there. I think they really want the... 
be there at that moment to take the fight, turn it around with the life stealer. They still have an opportunity to get the first down. BCM to get him. Then the jump in from Nisha puts him in a nasty position. Skeeter should be able to finish this up. Once again, there's going to be the false promise, but Nisha knows he's dead. He'll just go down fighting where he can. Amar's going to show up. Skeeter needs to go down. Overextending himself, Echo. Oh, Yoragi is overextending himself, and the Fisher straight over onto Amar with a nice touch there from Soxta as well. All right, Tundra striking back with this random river fight that just connected off the back of that smoke. BZM did not get PKB off or anything. That's a completely different fight if it goes the other way. Moonlight Shadow, this spell, it works at TI for a reason. Snaking, busting it out, doing a huge amount of work off the back of the smokes in this ult. I feel like this uh, this primal beast just dies so quickly whenever Skeeter's yeah. in the... I, I wonder if he should build some sort of armor. I mean, he's only got six base armor. Yeah, he might need a plate mail, or maybe he just I don't, needs to come in late and not be the one getting beat on by the snakes. Mm. I mean, this whole fighting situation here, I think, you know, maybe it's an element of uh, people who played at TI several times versus some some new players. I think BZM, you know, not getting the PKB off and being slightly out of range with the Oracle. There's a lot of, like, little small things there that are slightly messed up that, you know, ends up costing you pretty big. Your PL dies. Snaking. Not able to get that second leap off in time, Misha. Grabs him, stuns him, and brings him down to the grave with Lamar picking up the killing spree. That's it. I think OG, they are playing this game very fast, and they have a lot of wiggle room, too, in my opinion. Yeah, like, Tundra needs a lot more of those fights yeah. before I think they feel very confident going into this late game. And again, this is OG's playbook, right? You have the Amar damage dealing offlaner. You have this tricore with the power of the sustain behind it. This is a scary lineup to scale into. This Primal Beast can also scale like a monster. I mean, you're talking about Ags, Shiva's shard down the road. This is real spooky in the lake. So, you have to worry about this PL timings of your Tundra, but you also have to worry about what happens after that if you get past that point. And they're doing a good job of, you know, equalizing the, the net worth differential here. Soxa has got a lot of farm in the last five or six minutes. Like, he's almost a blink on top of the shard. Those fights helping him. OG want to keep the pace up, looking for 33. The birds are going to drop, stopping that channel. Shouldn't be a problem here for 33 to get out, but maybe Tundra wants to go back in. They see Amar, Skeeter leading the charge. He's going to start slowing him down. The Maelstrom actually does a little bit of damage there. BCM, oh, he was trying to hunt down Soxa. Now the BKB. Fisher, and once again, he's just getting to 100 to 0. No BKB going off. 33, Yuragi was trying to dress him to be able to eat through that cloak, but now Tundra playing together, went back to 33, made sure the Phantom Lancer wasn't a problem. Now they're gonna try and chase down some more heroes, and that's gonna be Taiga. Once again, he's following his course into battle, but when they lose that fight, he has no way out. And he is just the plus one after every lost team fight. Some rare mistakes from BZM, honestly. A player who's been extremely dominant over the past year. Just not getting the BKB off, not getting the DD off, maybe feeling a bit antsy, feeling like, man, we're so strong, I want to fight Tundra. They're like just out of the region. You know, he tries to this charge, but he reaches a bit too far, getting a little bit too thirsty for that fight, and it, yeah, it's, it's a big kill. I mean, like Avery said, they need a lot of these. Like, they, Tundra keeps winning these small fights, and it feels nice, but it's not like a game-ending thing, you know? But at some point, they add a bit too much, and maybe the pendulum swings back into Tundra's favor. Mm. Yeah, every one of these little skirmishes you lose, you're you're putting your PL timing back a little bit, right? Yeah, that's the timing that you want to hit and get the Roshan and get the full map control going. That timing's a little worse every one of these skirmishes you lose, and also for BZM. Yeah, I can Check in with the teams. He wants to charge. I'm going. How many can I fight? Um, can, can, can. Go, 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 go. I'm carrying it. Can you heal, heal, heal? Push in one. Shake us up, shake us up. I don't like, I don't like, please, please. I don't like, shake too much. I die. The call for the Yules there. I mean, if they had gotten that plus one hero, then that, that would have been such a massive difference, but... I think a pretty good sign they were able to call that off. I think sometimes when your core, your core players may be a bit nervous, they can get roped into some stuff, and him saying, no, 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 I don't like this, I'm not, I'm not doing this, I'm gonna die. Like, I think having that awareness and not getting, you know, pulled into something you don't like, I think is, is very clutch. Oh, this could be deadly. This is the blink reveal, too. This is the blink reveal. He's going to go and with this smoke get a, a really nice lane work. But if the smoke right, breaks right here, he's going to go for it. Fisher goes out, jumps right in. Echo, half health already. But the damage still isn't there. They need more follow from the rest of the team. Skeeter's trying to do what he can, but the false problem has already gone out on Yuragi. Yuragi's going to go back in. He needs that Aegis. Wants to be able to pick it up. And then it snaps it away. Now grabs up the Lifestealer, slams him down to the ground, and he's dead. 
Misha, he's going to fall, but the fight is won, and Tundra are on the retreat. 33, going to be chased down by BZM. Big, bad, primal beast slows him down, and they're going to just keep the vision. 33 has no way out of this one, I think. Slowly but surely. They're going to catch up to him. They're going to work him down, and that is going to be three heroes dying, and the Aegis picked up for OG. What a turn that could have been if only Tundra had been there with more heroes. Saxa hit the entry, but there was no follow-up. Huge amount of damage on that jump. That's the power of the Oracle, though. Keeps those cores alive, and more importantly, it's not BZM going down first. It means he gets brief spells, free BKB this time. No missed clicks or any bad clicks that fight. Gets the Aegis Snatch as well. Yeah, now he's super in a comfortable position. <laughs> The zoomer hands come in handy. There's, yeah. It's crazy how much impact these fights where everyone is just clicking Roche mm -hmm. and somebody clicks it first. Like, it has such a giant impact in the game. Maybe if Nakes takes that, the fight mm -hmm. swings the other way. But, you know, now suddenly, Tundra's sort of in that position where they really don't want to take that fight. Shout out to BZM for that positioning there. And being able super to charge good. back in was super important. I mean, even Misha is just staying alive in these fights for a huge amount of time. There's a lot of sustain on this OG lineup, and if you run out of damage, the damage from Tundra is pretty discreet. You have your spells, you throw out the Fissure, the Charge. They live through that, gives PL the turn. Aegis helps these fights stay even longer. Tundra need to think about who they're prioritizing these fights, who they're jumping, who they're going on, syncing the damage up with the stuns, and then maybe resetting, right? You don't want to get caught in a situation where you're giving too much time for PL without the control of one. Maybe the one upside is Aegis is not on that Phantom Lancer. Yeah. The sieging is a bit worse from OG, but that said, I don't think Yoragi's too scared. He's, yeah, definitely isn't. No, he is not scared at all. They're going to once again do the turnaround with a Fissure and put some damage onto him. But, of course, not only does he have Oracle, he's got the Aegis, he's got a BKB. Charge from behind. Jump out there. Ooh, this is interesting. Too. Vanish gets two. The most important hero, Oracle, dies first, and Misha's going to fall too. BZM has already lost his Aegis. Tundra, this charge in from nine, may have just set them up for a fantastic team fight. Other the second part, he's going to get the charge on through. Doesn't actually hit the real Phantom yeah, Lancer. But the charge comes in from BZM this time with the Onslaught. He's going to go for the BKB TP out and just make sure he stays alive. Thanks to the uproar, that extra armor is going to go to work. What a disaster of a push. What a charge angle from 9. How just, did he get that? He was just an enemy jungle farming after the, the Lost Roach fight. Just comes in from behind. He had the charge on the Primal Beast. You show it. Ends up catching the Oracle with the Infest. Don't mind if I do right there, sir. <laughs> I mean, I think Nine quietly playing a really, really good game. I think keeping up this level of net worth on a Spear Breaker, especially after such a rough start, after the map being kind of scary. Like him having this 10,000 net worth, having this BKB, continuing the scaling is really important, not only for like their continued scaling, but also just like it's, it's so important for their heroes that he's able to have this net worth. I think Nine's played a really good game so far. Yeah, Spear Breaker is one of those sets of core. It kind of snowballs in that regard, right? If you get to the Shadow Blade, Aghanim, Scepter, and such, and you one-shot waves, then you just continue to build up on those items. But if you don't get to that point, you just become another support, perhaps. Uh oh He's going to maybe have to blow the BKB. Nope, the Fisher's going to come through. Oh, really good setup. Another Echo. Nice They're going to change on Yoragi. Oh, the offside. It's not enough to be able to save him. The BKB goes down from nine. They go for the Infest. Nine can keep the charge going up, but he's immediately... He had a laser focus. He is looking out for that Oracle. He's got a head on a swivel. He found yeah, him, well. and now they're going to be able to get the Timber Saw as well. Nine. Really good save. I mean, Skeeter jumping inside of him enabled that in the first place, but Nine being able to find the right hero to charge every time. Man, that's the sign of a Visage player right there, too. I it didn't even look like the bird was even close, but he knows the range of the drop so oh, long. He yeah. just barely clips him on the edge. Getting that plus one kill, like, that's the top net worth Timber saw. The amount of gold you get from that, the amount of time this guy's dead now, suddenly they take over the map, the Spearberry gets more items, Nakes finishes off the Mjolnir, which has a really large impact oh, dealing yeah. with this PL, and PL doesn't even have heart yet. Yeah, I, I feel like OG wanted to use that Aegis to get to that PL timing, get him the heart, and then cement this game in that last five minutes. Tundra's just taken over this game. These charges are just nasty. You get the charge through on multiple heroes, the infest bomb comes out, there's a fissure follow-up, an aftershock follow-up on that. It's so much AoE control. There's not much spell immunity on this OG side. They just got that BKB on a bar. The BCN one he's had forever, but for the rest of these OG heroes, they're still trying to get there. I mean, Misha's trying to get to his own. I almost feel like there's a little bit of a displacement between uh the Yuragi and where his items are at and how he's playing. I feel like if he has the heart, he can be like kind of frontline like he's been doing, but 
without that, it's just so many times he's been fissured. They've been able to, like, as you say, charge through and just a lot of, like, incidental damage brings him down to, like, half health. I mean, it's also about how OG wants to start the fight. It's a bit awkward for OG to find the opening. Yeah. You have this Shadow Blade Breaker charging on the map. Everybody's Moonlight shadowed, like, haste rune drummed around in the back line. You're not going to find the Shaker. He has four staff and blink now. Do you want to just go on the Visage? It's pretty awkward, right? Even the Nakes is invested. You're, you don't even see these heroes. <laughs> Elite metaphor staff, snaking. The Yule's on cooldown. He'll be able to just TP out before Nisha is able to put a stop to him. We have the Aghanim Scepter now done on the Visage, so big damage upgrade. We said damage was a bomb for Tundra, yeah. uh, and that is a huge, huge upgrade right there. BZM, though, does now have his own Aghanim Scepter, so look out for that one and the break mechanic, too. They're sneaking. Another charge. BKB immediately going to go out. They're going to try and disengage. They force something out of Amar, and if they can cleanly get out, reset, and maybe go again, they'll feel pretty good about it. I mean, this is a dynamic. We didn't really talk about that much, but while Dyer may have had some damages earlier in the game, they have no issues of stuns. OG really not very easy for them to start fights. It's either a charge, it's a Marcy jump, it's an Oracle Q. Not really super consistent ways. Dyer has like 15 angles, 12 stuns, like they're coming from all different places. And if Rainy isn't invincible, at some point it's a little bit spooky for OG to actually start the fight like everybody was saying. Now Tundra just boldly going into the triangle here. Yuragi's gonna start it off though. Yeah, once again, they the found the Shaker. Sinking. They found the Earth Shaker, that is so important. They have the chakra going out. Soxic is a little bit of four step away. Sinking helps him out and he manages to reset. Meanwhile, Skeeter put the damage and already killed Misha. They're gonna find the real Phantom Lancer here. Managed to get the ultimate off on him too. He's gonna be false promised. They need to be able to save him. BZM right in the middle of things. Trying to go for the break, but the Vincent took hardly any damage whatsoever. And it seems like Tundra as a whole are looking pretty good as the Echo goes out in the back lines to try and distance himself away. Away from the this stuns. And now the rest of the team starts funneling in. They weren't able to get that chain stun. Visage needs to get out as well. Fortunately, that Aghanim Scepter allowing him to fly away. He's keeping on top of Yuragi. While Lamar did find a little cubby hole to be able to TP out. So both the sidelines are going to be able to retreat and reset. But Tundra, once again, walking away the victors of the team fights. When was the last time OG won a fight? When was the last time they killed a good target? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about fights. It's just so hard to latch on to any of these heroes for OG. I mean, the stuns are pretty much on BZM to lock somebody down so Mark can get the damage out. They're surviving for a decent amount of time, but even that Shaker kill, that is the best target they can get in these fights. Find the Shaker on the back line, take him out. He removes so much control. He gets the force out, and he's living. Now all of a sudden, this fight is super weird, right? There's going to yeah. be more fissures coming in. You have to kind of try and fight around your Phantom Lancer, but he's getting his ass beat. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it really was. Once again, BZM didn't pop the BKB right away. He got hit by the, the Visage yes. stun as he charged in. A little bit costly. And that cost him the Earthshaker kill. I mean, it's just so annoying. There's so much random yeah. stuns in this game that you can't see. Yeah. Anybody can be invis charging through. There's some birds invis drops on your head. I feel arrow for him. Hitting all the clutter. Yeah, there's a random arrow in here, you know? <laughs> Not an easy game. I mean, it's also a game where... This PL here, he's not really able to solo kill people because there are so many stuns on Dire. There's so much kiting, the four staff, the invis, all this garbage. Oh, no, they're in best charge. Oh, they oh, found the, the Oracle. They had the vision. They get the charge, and they also hit Nisha at the same time. So both supports already dead in this team fight. Meanwhile, Yuragi, most of his time was spent being stunned. Visage familiars and the Visage himself dropping one after the other completely stalled out any damage he could get down during that time. Tundra is going to respect OG here. They should. A buyback went out from the Oracle, so they got a lot out of that. No reason to push their luck. How can OG support play? Like, you can see what Tundra is doing. Like, OG has no way to actually kill heroes unless Tundra messes up some. They're spacing them, they're abusing the stun, the invis, the four staffs. Like, Yuragi is desperately looking for a target to lock onto, but he's just getting kited and the supports are just getting exploded instantly. Yeah, it really does. Maybe this is, we talked about the drafting and their plan for nine. I mean, both times they drafted a hero that gets to the back line. We said OG, part of their setup here, the reason they're able to play so greedy on their cores is having these backline supports, these healers and stuff. So Tundra definitely came into this with the game plan of nine is going to be killing Taiga over and over again. And now if he dies again, that's that buyback cooldown as well. Yeah. You're out for a long time. It's just hard to protect this backline for OG. There's just so many ways to get in there. The birds can get vision in this, get the charge with the infest. What actually prevents that? You need detection down and you need to use this guy. He could be a BKB as well. I feel like OG needs to get that two big items in this game. It's got to be Abyssal on the Phantom Lancer and Hex on Timber. 
That is a very far way away. If they get there, I think now you have the disable. Is there anything else besides items? Is there a way they can set up the fight? I mean, find the supports. Yeah. Well, your supports are going to be found. <laughs> it's just the side of OG. Misha getting picked off there as Tuncher once again. Really abusing this Moonlight Shadow. I mean, Smirana as a fine position seems pretty value at this point. At this point, you have no issue with the hero. It is doing an insane amount of work in these fights. You have limited detection, especially most of the time, you know, detection coming out from your four and five. This is not a four and five duo that wants to front line to play in a century or yeah. something. Like <laughs> you just instantly die. The core's gotta do it because they're the ones who are up in front. Yeah, and we actually saw OG had a gem earlier in this game. That's why they got it. Because they knew they needed this vision on the front line. Yeah. That was lost a long time ago. Taiga's gem in the hands of 33 Visage for a decent amount of time now. Not easy to take these fights vision-wise, and Tundra looking for the, the pincer maneuver here. Yes, they are. They found the real Yuragi. Can they get the arrow stun? Not quite. He does manage Doppelganger away to the side. They have the Fisher to stall it up, but at this point... 33 in the back, though. Point. Oh, he is in the back, and he's going to be able to catch. He's, they spotted the Oracle. Their charge is coming through, and he's already dead. BCM, meanwhile, does manage to grab 33. They've broken him and managed to get through his cloak, but he dropped down into stone form, so he's good. And Skeeter now comes in with a cleanup. A charge on through. Bumping BZM. Gets a bash as well. He's good. Slammed on the Yuragi, and that is it. Triple pickup for Skeeter, ultra kill in the end. And now it's time to go high ground. Tundra, it was looking a little suspect in the first 15 minutes. We weren't sure if they were gonna be able to pull through, but they had a strong understanding of how to play up against OG. And now it's gonna be a lane. It's gonna be straight up tier four. So are we gonna go for it? They are going. That's a Amar. Amar buys out Ags. He's trying to get the extra damage oh to this Oh my god. The double chakrams are going to be thrown out. This could be really messy. This could be... You have a serious lead here. You don't necessarily need to do this. If Bile has to buy back here, it would be a disaster for OG's item progression. Let's see if they can hold. Double, double Chakram's doing so much damage. This buyout of the Aghanim Scepter, it may just be what bails out OG, Man, or maybe Tundra can't be stop. done. Mecha gets up. Oh, the Vintage is dead! He doesn't manage to get up the Stone Fort. They've already cleared through the ages as well. Nine, he's going to have to jump away. The Shadow Blade back out. Soxa spotted as well. Oh, no. Tundra. Now they're not even going to be able to get Elena Barracks off of that. They no cleared infest. out the Tier 4s. No Infest. He's got an Armly Toggle to work with, but he needed to get grabbed. The charge on through. And yeah. nine. He gets canceled by the AoE stun from BZM, and now Nine is going to be in some trouble. Run down by the Phantom Rush. A chance of revenge. A charge away just in time. The last bit of damage wasn't there quite yet. Tundra still a massive lead. Don't get me wrong, but surely they would have felt very good having Elena Barracks up and not giving away those kills. Man, that is one of those calls at TI. It's like, <laughs> it's a nice edge call if it's worth it or not. They get that Phantom Lancer buyback, though. So all things said, Probably still slightly favoring Tundra here, just destroying that PL economy. I think you're happy to sacrifice your life stealer once for that, but it's so you definitely hard feel good if you're so far, I need the building. We need stunts. We need stunts. We need the fun text. I don't reach. It's not about text only. Oh, you're totally right, Avery. Yeah, Stun's yeah. big problem for OG. Yeah, I, they need this Hex, they need the Abyssal. The Abyssal's just off the menu now, man. I mean, yeah. this PL is never going to get there. So even more falls to Amar. That Axe purchase was pretty clutch. Helps him defend the throne there. No way. He's on his way to Hex, but he is far. Yeah. OG trying to abuse this Lifestealer downtime as much as possible to get to that condition. I thought, I thought maybe 9 spotting Yuragi there. I thought maybe they'd go for it. That would be a dieback like that could this, just be game. When this the game, game is ahead. on a this game's on a bar. Yeah. Like, Radiant this ag, the double chakram has to connect with, with the shaker, with with the visage off of a stun. Again, limited stuns, you gotta yeah. make the damage count. He has to connect these spells. If you're gonna bet on one Timbersaw in the world to do it, it's probably this guy. Yeah, they need some like sneaky wards that Tundra like walks onto. They have some ward hidden in the corner and suddenly Tundra's on vision. And Amar gets this blink angle where he yep. double chakras the guy and insta kibs the shaker before he has time to react. I mean the Marcy rebound huge as well. Like that fight, Misha connects with two or three. That's their best stun, right? That's gonna set up the primal beast to engage, it's gonna set up the timber salt damage. A lot of this game might be coming down to to Marcy. Yeah, some of these earlier fights, just the charge throughs and the the chain stunning that can come out if you're on the retreat from OG, you are not getting out for this one. Well, all eyes then on the Misha Amar duo. See if they can get the combination of the right initiating stun oh, and the damage to follow it up to win a fight for OG. This 
So great opportunity if they can get it. The sneaking kill, maybe not so much, but the Earthshaker does manage to slip away. Now the charge on through, they couldn't even kill the pot up. Misha is now dead. Amar's looking for something to be able to hunt, but look at Soxa playing the edges here. He's ready to go back in. The charge is controlling up BTM. He's not getting anything off. Now they've got the Fisher. The chain's done on the Phantom Lancer. Yes, a false promise goes off last second, but is he even going to be able to have the heals? He's got the heart pumping away. He starts to throw some damage over to nine, but it's just pitiful. Not He's going to get stomped out. The heart GG. regen is not going to be enough, and GG is called Tundra. 2-0 over OG. They've done it again. They set themselves in a position to be able to match up against their rivals within the Western European region. They said, we are good enough to take you. They have lost some series before, but the important ones they've managed to pull through against OG, and they did it again on the most important stage of all here at TI. You know, four years ago, Snaking was also top of his group. And that team had a choice between OG and LGD, and we chose OG, and it did not end well. This time around, the Dark Pact, or whatever you want to call it, has been broken to a degree, and he's over to, able to overcome some of these past demons. It's very cool to see these storylines. I think OG put up a hell of a fight in that game, too, though. Not an easy game to play. I think no. all of us underestimated how tough that game was going to get in the mid-game. Yeah. Maybe even them a little bit. And once those stuns start coming out, what yeah. a hell of a game from Nine on the Spear Breaker. Yeah, Nine and Skitter both, honestly, just super high impact in this game. You talk about Skitter's leaning in Nix against a Timber Saw, and he's still like top net worth. He's highest damage. We expect low damage from Sunny, just killing everyone. I think Skitter had like an insanely good game. Great performances all around by Team Tundra, and uh, I'm sure the panel has a lot more to say about this 2 0 over OG. We do indeed. Thank you so much, Cap, SVG, and Quinn. Another 2 0 here in this upper bracket, but this is the